Okay, hi everyone. Thanks, Eddie. I really feel loved by you, mate. I just want you to know that. Eddie just shouted out, hiya, Tim. <laughs> I was like, the solitary voice. I really appreciate it. My name's Tim. I'm one of the team here. I d look, if you've never heard me speak before, um, there, are, there are kind of two rules that you need to abide by. One is, um, one is that it, I like a conversation. So I love a heckle, and I love a, good, I love a good quality heckle as well. That one wasn't. No, I'm joking. It was great. Um, I, love a, I love an intervention, like, a, like a, a question or a thought. Like I love it, and, and I'll try and engage with that as much as po possible. The second rule is if there's two ways to take things, and one of them makes you feel depressed, angry, or upset, I meant the other one. <laughs> um, we're just, in a, we're just in a very interesting time as a church, and I am so grateful for what God's been doing in this last few months. I hope you've been excited by the process, and we're in this series about church, um, where we're, we're looking at, yeah, macro, what, what, is, what is the purpose of the church? What has God called us to be and to do, but also what is the micro, what is the local church, what is it God's called us to be uh, and to do. So we've had aspects of vision from Andrew, um, we've had a prophetic word from Mark, we've got more vision coming next week from John and then me on the 20th. And me and Adam have been talking about the, the kind of macro, what is the church, because we're in the Ancient Roots series, which is an opportunity to go through the Apostles' Creed and actually declare some of these statements of, of belief. And we're in this section that says, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. And so last week, we had a great talk on the Chaffinch. Um, did you remember that? No? Who was here for the joke? I thought it was great. You should have been here if you weren't here. And, and you would have got the joke. But um, it was an amazing uh, talk from Adam. And he really culminated the whole thing talking about relationship. Talking about relationship. See, I, <laughs> I think the essence of the church is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is a relationship to God, the upwards. There's a relationship to one another, the inwards. And there's a relationship to the world, the outwards. Okay, Three very specific, very clear callings for everyone in the church. Okay, So you don't get to be part of the church, a confession of faith, unless you are part of those three relationships that God has ordained for each one of us. And the local church is really that inward sense of God helping us work out our identity and our calling together, actually knocking corners off one another, one another encouraging one another, meeting together daily, it says, as long as it's called today. Um, you know, there's, there's so much in the scripture about that relational aspect. And I was going to focus this week on confession, repentance, and reconciliation all in one week, but I'm not going to do that. I actually, I, I, because I felt like um, the, the essence of relationship within the church is the willingness to have hard feet and soft hearts, okay? That is hard feet in that when people tread on your toes, you're not easily offended, but soft hearts in that we extend grace and love to one another in a way that's palpable so that when people look on to the church, they go, look at the way they love one another. Because brokenness is inevitable, isn't it? But our identity is holiness. So we get to be a church that's full of broken people. That is all of us. And we get to be a church that is the holy representation of the kingdom of God. It's a paradox, isn't it? But how we work it out is the purpose of the church. I hope that's not too confusing. It's some ramblings, really, about what the church is. But today I really want to focus on courage. Because I feel like we're in a phase where God is leading us into some stuff. Where I've got lots of phrases for what this means. But essentially, where we need to kind of man up a bit, if you'll excuse the terminology. And be courageous. Be courageous. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to lead us through a progression, which I hope will be really helpful. 
<laughs> uh, and before I, get, before I get into the scripture, I'm going to say this. The church is God's plan for the world. Okay? Absolutely. And not just the church. The church. The local church is God's plan for the world. I cannot honestly stand in front of you and say, I see another plan articulated in the scripture. So it's not like one day God's going to sweep through and just forget the agency of man and and he's not going to use us anymore. He's just going to just like bomb us with the Holy Spirit and everyone's going to just be flattened in his presence. No, God, God has beautifully chosen to use his people, the church, to carry out the kingdom on earth. It's a phenomenal thing. But God's plan for the world is the church. And the major building blocks of the church are you. Living stones built together to form this this that is the church, the body of Christ. And so I, 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 want to, I want to liberate us today, but I also want us to realize sometimes it's hard to know where we belong and we feel like, oh, do we really fit in and, and stuff. And I want to say right now, every one of you is a living stone built into the fabric of the church, which is God's plan for the world. Who can look at the world and see the mess? Can anyone do that? two people which is phenomenal because like but we can see the mess can't we every single day anyone choose now not to watch the news and hope brexit will just go away like an ostrich (laughs) everyone got their brexit plan through the post like we can see the mess can't we of relationships of politics of of crime of selfishness of a lack of identity in our world and, and we are the people of God. The church is the group of people who should know their purpose to their very core. And each one of you are living stones built into this house. Called by God to own your identity in him as a priest and as a king. Can I get an amen? amen. Because we're called to live a different life. And this is the call of God on the church, to be his people. It's a phenomenal thing. So we'll get into this um, scripture. (coughs) Do excuse me. So we're in Joshua 1, 6 to 9, and I'm going to read this to you. It says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you'll be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, here we have a declaration from God to Joshua about his identity and about the identity of the people of God. And this promise um, was not a new one. It was also given to Moses. In fact, it was a legacy promise right the way back to Abraham. And if you know the story of the Old Testament, you, you know, sometimes just reading right through, um, you know, the, the stories in, in Genesis where we see really the birth of God's people in, in that sense through, through Abraham and all the stories that lead on through Moses, through uh, the, the exodus and then the forming of the law and, and then, you know, the prophets and the kings and, and, and that whole story of God's people. Um, Jesus said about that, all of that speaks about me. Okay, so when we talk about Jesus, we are, we are the people of God in Jesus who have inherited a story, a big story. So we're not just part of 
the church global. We're part of the story of God's people from the beginning of time. And we are the recipients of the treasure that is redemption through Jesus. Okay? So we now carry the kingdom of God in a whole new covenant as we have for the last 2,000 years as God's people. We carry that treasure, what does the scripture say, in jars of clay, recognizing the brokenness of humanity, but the treasure that God has placed in us. That's who we are. Okay, so we're part of this big story (laughs) and the story of Israel. And um, I want to talk about courage, really, um, from, from the perspective of this story. And we're going to get into another few bits of writing about this story. Um, but let's just think about courage for a second. Okay, what do you think of when I say courage and don't say bitter? Okay, what do you think of when I say courage? Bravery. Okay, Anything, does anyone else get this kind of slightly macho sense of courage? That's like, like, like a you know, willingness to do something crazy. Or that, so I'm a, I'm a surfer, and I, I love to surf. I was just saying to Josh, I, I surfed in, in the UK. I don't have a lot of courage in these things, but I surfed in the UK once, and it was 10 foot, which means the back of the wave. So the faces are, what, 15 to 18 foot, potentially, so big. And I paddled out, and I basically it took me three hours to decide to catch a wave. So I paddled far out. Okay, and then I was like, and I caught one shoulder wave in, and all the way in, I was like, thank you, Jesus, because I did not want to get mashed. So I don't really have a lot of courage, but you, you might think courage looks a bit like, like this, you know, where, where someone, see this guy, this is a, this is a, a, a break called Chope, so Tiopu, and, and when people drop in on here, there's like two foot of water and then rocks, okay? Do you think that's courage? Right. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? So I, I'm going to argue that that isn't courage, okay? And, and those kind of big, brave decisions, they're not courage. And, and in fact, the only difference between courage in that sense and stupidity is diligence. The only di- you know what I mean? It's like, oh no, I, I thought it'd be courageous, but then I checked and realized it was only two foot deep and there's a massive rock underneath, so I'm not going to do it. The stupidity is just going, I'm going to do it anyway. Isn't it, right? Have you ever been in a situation in life where you've thrown yourself into it without really thinking? Relationships, people do this with sometimes. They're just like, I'm just feeling in love. Can't see the wood for the trees. Get into a situation. Mm, it's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky, isn't it? But have you ever thrown yourself into something? I've thrown myself into stuff. I've just gone, yeah, I'm going to go for it. And then you kind of backtrack in like three weeks later thinking, I really shouldn't have thrown myself into that. I mean, conversely, right, you can be so diligent about a decision that you end up completely overthinking it and getting yourself wound up in a mess of kind of um, reasons to not do anything. Do you, have you ever been bound up by thinking too much about a situation? Something you know to be right? Well... I think with courage, where we're asked to step into something that God's called us to, there are three ways we can respond to it. One is courage and action. Okay, it's like going, God, I've heard what you've said. I'm going to step into what you've said. The second is kind of negligence and ambivalence. Ever been in that place where you're just like, I know what God's called me to do, but I'm just going to kind of tuck it away. And I'm going to stick my head in the sand and kind of hope it goes away or just ignore it for a bit. Or oh, that's too tricky. And the third thing is anxiety and fear. And, I, you know, I'm asking you, I want you to engage with this. Have you ever felt like you're in a place where God's called you to do something and you just feel anxious about it? You just feel fearful about it? So there's three responses, okay? Anxiety and fear, negligence, ambivalence, courage, action. We're going to read a story from Numbers 30, and I'm going to unpack a few observations from this story to kind of help us with how to respond to what God's doing. This story says this, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. Now, this was the 12 spies who were sent into the promised land. Please put your hand right up if you've ever heard this story about the 12 spies. 
going into the land. Okay, so I know then to fill in a few blanks for people. There were 12 spies sent by the Israelite people into the promised land across the Jordan. They were meant to go and look at everything. What is the land like? Does it produce good fruit? Are there people there? Are they strong? Do they have fortified buildings? They were doing a full reconnoiter of the land, and they went into the land, and this is them coming back to the community. And they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. Now, if you go back a bit, or forward a bit, in fact, um, it says that the fruit was carried by just two men with a pole, uh, and it says they had one bunch of grapes between two of them. Now, I just want you to imagine that bunch of grapes. That is a large bunch of grapes. Ooh, I couldn't crush a grape. Um, it's a bit, it's, there's a lot of fruit, okay? Um, we went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey, and here is its fruit. Here. <laughs> but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. And we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, Hey, we should go in and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the, the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. So I want you to get this. There's, there's really Joshua and Caleb among the 12, okay? The 12 spies that come back, Joshua and Caleb are the guys who are going, uh, we should take this land, but they've seen what everyone else has seen, but the other 10 are really, it's fear and anxiety time, and they are spreading rumors among the Israelite people about this land. Now, I want you to hear this. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. As a phrase, okay? Just think about that. We're off to France for the day. Mm, I wouldn't go there. It devours the people living in it. Okay. I knew they liked eating, but that's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> the people we saw there are of great size. They're going to build on this. We saw the Nephilim there. Nephilim uh, hybrids. Spiritual hybrids, born of angels and men. Like, it gets weird here, okay? We saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers. This is, this is it. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I just want you to ponder that for a second. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. I'm going to skip on a bit to Joshua. And Joshua, the son of Nun, this was, uh, sorry, Numbers 14, verse 6. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, were among those who had spied out the land. They tore their clothes and said to the congregation of Israel, the land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Then all the congregation, that's probably around about a million people at this point, entering into the land. Then all the congregation said, why don't we just stone them? It's really interesting. This, I find this scripture so interesting about following the word of God. So <laughs> let's look quickly through a few observations about this passage that I, I hope will help you in your journey now. First of all, let's think about track record. God had promised the people the land of Canaan. Like, make no bones about it, right? Because God didn't. He was like really clear that I've given this land into your hands. In fact, in, in Exodus 23, 31, it says, um, and this is God speaking to Moses about the land. I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hands, and you shall drive them out before you. There is a direct promise to Moses, not just about the land, but about the obstacles that they're going to face. He says, I will drive out your enemies. Okay? Now, <clears throat> track records. God had a reasonably good track record at this point. Okay? The people of God, no, 
not so good, all right? So God had led the Israelites out of Egypt, hadn't he? Have you all seen, seen the, the various depictions of, of that journey out of Egypt where God leads them by a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke, um, where he leads them, where he opens up the sea and the Israelites cross the sea into the desert and he leads them through the desert and he feeds them in all manner of ways. That one's free. <laughs> he does. He feeds them miraculously, doesn't he? All kinds of things, including manna, of course. Um, in case you didn't get that joke. Um, <clears throat> he's got some track record. I'm going to put this to you. When we're called to make a courageous decision that God has called us to, the, our due diligence is this. What has God said? What has God said? said. That's where it starts, and that's where it ends, okay? Our due diligence is, what has God said? I think um, the, the people here were struggling because they were not listening to what God had said, despite the voices among them who were going, God has said we can take this land. God has said he will give this land to us. God has said, God has said. That's the defining factor in our due diligence. (laughs) Now, in this process of of kind of vision, we've been praying, we've been thinking, God's been leading us. It's been largely a four-year journey in different ways. And we've got a few things that we're feeling God has said. And And then when Mark Isles... He, he's a friend of ours. He's been a friend for 18 years within our context. Spoke a prophetic word that was, that was just confirming what God had said. For us, it was liberating. Because our diligence in this area was, what has God said? Okay? This Freedom Church, we are called to be a church that is ready to pursue God with relentless commitment. That means we're ready to hear what God has said to us as a church and do it, like step into it. Now, we've got more diligence to come where we work out exactly what God's calling us to. But sometimes, doesn't he, he lets you go into the land and you don't really know what the next plan is. You just get to the city, fortified city, and you see its walls and he just says, walk around it seven times. And sometimes you don't know the precise details of how God is going to overcome some of the stuff that he's called you to walk into. Who knows that in their own life? Thank you, Chris. I love you. All of us know that. We know that, don't we? When we step into what God wants, sometimes, you know, we get to obstacles. We get to problems. And God liberates us by giving us a way through. (laughs) <laughs> Second, the land was full of good things. That's my second observation about this passage. The land was full of good things. It was a land described as flowing with milk and honey. That means cows and bees, both of which are really important for beef, dairy products, and honey and pollinating plants. There was a, it's richness, isn't it? That's what it depicts. Milk and honey is like just the wealth of the land. There is the wealth of the land. The land was filled with good things. Who knows that when God calls you to step into something, his promise is full of good things. I know that. In in fact, i I put it to you that sometimes us as a church, sometimes we as God's people, we interpret the instructions of God as in some way stemming our joy. So when he gives us an instruction, sometimes we think it's a controlling thing or, no, but I don't want to do that. I know better. And we go and do stuff and then we get in a mess and then we come back. But actually, every instruction that God gives us is to protect us and provide for us in the context of who he's made us to be. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So when he instructs you in a certain way, it's not to control you or manipulate you, it's to protect you and provide for you. And in this, when we know that God has said something, it's full of good things. This land was full of good things. 
<clears throat> Observation three. The land was full of giants. Isn't that also true? There are obstacles. <clears throat> Verse 28 says, But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very uh, large. Does anyone feel sometimes like the giants are just too big? Like it's just too hard? I, I'm really struggling here. I, I, I want to invite you to respond, okay? Because we're humans in a place where we're seeking after what God is doing. Is anyone in their life ever feel like the giants are just too big? Yeah. We do, don't we? And it's really good for people to know that actually... All of us face obstacles and things that in and of ourself, we cannot overcome. Addiction. We cannot in and of ourselves just go the next day, I'm going to be better today. Health issues, family issues, friendship issues. We can't in and of ourselves sometimes overcome those giants. This land of promise that God was calling the people to was full of giants. Let me tell you this, that impossibility is the only allotment in which the plants of miracles can grow. Impossibility is the only allotment in which the plants of miracles can grow. If you don't face impossibility, you will not see the hand of God in your life. I think sometimes when we think it, we've got it all sewn up, that's when we're most out of the plan of God. When we feel like it's trepidation, I think sometimes we can go, wow, only God can do this. Okay. <clears throat> Four, if you focus on the impossible rather than the promise, fear and anxiety ensue. Okay. If your gaze is transfixed by the size of the giants and their massive buildings, you can only be fearful and anxious. It's like if, you're, if your gaze is, is captured by the, impossible, the impossibility of things, it, you are rendered useless by those things sometimes. Isn't that true? I once, when I was a kid, and this isn't courage, again, this isn't courage, but I was stood on a cliff, and it was, it, it was bordering 80 foot. Okay, it was called gold. It was a jump. And I was 11 years old, and I wanted to jump off this jump because all my mates were doing it. Um, but I just couldn't muster the strength. And because I was focused on the height of this thing, I started quivering. You're probably thinking that was sensible. It really was sensible. I did eventually do it, and I live to tell the tale. It's great, but it was stupid. But sometimes when we're so focused on the problem, we'd, it's just knee-knocking, and we can't do anything in the situation. And I want to point to this downward spiral of the people when they're going into the promised land. <laughs> it's hilarious. When you read it over and over again, it's, it's absolutely crazy. They go, they go, oh, yeah, but there are giants in the land. Uh, and they're massive. And they come from the people of Anak. And we saw the Nephilim. And they culminate in this identity statement. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. What does that mean? That means in their hearts, they were themselves pathetic in comparison to the problem. Have you ever felt like that? But then they make it. Now, you can guarantee they didn't do a survey monkey, right? But they made a statement about what the people saw as well. They didn't go, oh, excuse me, could you just tell us exactly what we look like in your eyes? <laughs> yes, you look like grasshoppers. Oh, excellent. That fulfills our... You know, they made an assumption, and we look pathetic to them. So what had they done? They had totally mis-stewarded mis the fact that they were God's people. Okay? Now, they might have looked like grasshoppers to the enemy. But the fact is, they were looking like grasshoppers to themselves as well. If you see yourself as someone who's ineffective and small in the face of your enemy... If you see yourself as just yourself, then you've missed the point of your true identity. You are called of God. 
You are his people. You as an individual are, you are seeded with imperishable seed. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are given the full resources of the kingdom of God with which to outwork your kingdom mandate to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted to set captives free, to restore the sight of the blind, to proclaim God's favor. You have been given a kingdom mandate where you carry what it is to be Jesus' people in the world, and you are not a grasshopper. And people, it doesn't matter how they see you. The wrong thing to do is try and guess what they see you like. Who knows? (laughs) <laughs> that if you focus on, the, focus on the impossible rather than the word of God, the size of the opposition makes us question our very identity. This is what I love what, what Mary's doing with champions particularly. She, the whole time that our kids are in champions, she is reaffirming their identity. They as a team are reaffirming their identity as royalty, as the children of the king. I tell you what, when you see a problem, but you know that you're the king's people, it is completely different. And it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt or need courage, but let me tell you, your courage is fed by knowing what God has said, not just about the situation, but primarily about you. Otherwise, you get to this point where it's like we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Observation five, I need to move forward. Uh, The problem itself becomes food. This is my favorite phrase in this whole thing. When Joshua and Caleb effectively are saying this, do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they are our bread. For they are our bread. You've got 10 spies saying, these guys are massive, you know, there's fully tooled up and going to bust us. And then you've got two two guys going, they're our bread. Like the the promise of God is, is in the possibility of a miracle. Where we see impossibility, we get to see God working out his promise in us as his people. Flip. Does that make, in some ways, it makes me want to go, God, help me. Help me to walk with your viewpoint, your vision, and see what you're doing. See the problems as possibilities. I've totally overrun my time. Will you forgive me? Um, I'm going to ask us to respond. Um, I, I, the primary thing about this is you can have courage in what God's called you to when you know what He said. Let what he has said about who you are be the defining factor in what you think about yourself. What lies at the moment are you believing about who you are that are crippling you into a place of fear and anxiety? What do you need to believe about who God said you are to step into the impossibility of a miracle and knowing that God has spoken over you and to you and we're going to break bread again we, in this period. We want to celebrate the communion of the saints. And when we break bread today, I'm going to invite you to come and break bread together and reaffirm to one another, you are part of the people of God. If you, ha- if you can say this morning that I've asked Jesus to be Lord of my life, I've asked him to set me free and forgive me, you can break bread together and say, you are a child of the king. No matter what your giants look like, you are a child of the king and invite people into a new place of courage, knowing your identity. Is that okay? So I'm going to ask you to stand and you're going to have to help today um, just to just to be free. Just move around, move out your seats, just to come and break bread as we worship. Come and break bread together, break bread with someone, break bread, affirm someone's identity. Can I pray for us before I go? Lord God, I pray right now that you would, in your people, reestablish our identity as your children. 
Lord, fill us with courage, knowing what you've said, into a time where we need courage. Holy Spirit, I pray as we break bread with one another, you be healing people where they have questions about their identity. In Jesus' name, amen.